Welcome to HMG Live, a production of HMG Strategy, your global partner helping you reinvent the future of work. Home to the HMG Strategy Top Technology Executives to Watch Awards, and also offering the HMG Marketplace, a fast, easy, safe, and efficient way to connect with the right vendors for your technology needs. We can't be together at these events, right? But I think the next best thing is being able to connect through the marketplace. And now, a warm welcome to today's host, lead principal and CEO of HMG Strategy, Hunter Muller. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2020 New Jersey, New Jersey CIO Executive Leadership Summer Muller, lead principal at HMG Strategy. My team, delighted to be here with you today. I think it really have a world-class agenda, some amazing speakers uh, and a great lineup. So um, happy you can make it and uh, you're here today. A big shout out to our partners, Avanti, OutSystems and Sonotype. We couldn't do today without you. Really appreciate your support and sponsorship. When they do reach out to you, please set up a 20 minute call uh, and uh, learn more about their interesting uh, software solutions and uh, infrastructure products. Uh, big shout out to uh, New Jersey Sim, and I want to welcome Candace Fleming to uh, the stage here. Candace, really appreciate your partnership over the years and uh, welcome to the program. Thanks very much, Hunter. Um, I don't know how many of you may be familiar with the Society for Information Management, um, but we are senior IT professionals who love IT and who celebrate our enjoyment of the profession by networking and coming together to enjoy great programs like this one. And we are happy to be here um, sharing in the hosting of it with you. Um, we also work together to mentor one another and support our respective professional development. We're actually one of 30 chapters across the United States and 5,000 members. So in a normal year, the New Jersey SIM chapter meets monthly at the Madison Hotel in Madison. Um, we share dinner and a program and do a lot of talking um, and a little bit of drinking. But in the current challenging year, um, we continue to meet virtually, sometimes over virtual happy hours, um, sometimes networking and always strengthening our professional relationships. Um, and we welcome senior IT directors from all industries across New Jersey. I've actually been a member of New Jersey SIM for some 30 years, please don't tell anybody, um, as I've moved to different senior management roles in IT across the pharmaceutical, consumer products, and most recently the higher education industries. I have friends in SIM who go back 30 years, and I have other more recent friends in SIM um, that I love seeing on a monthly basis. New Jersey SIM actually helps me step out of my day-to-day -day headaches um, at Montclair State University um, and gives me a chance to reacquaint myself with the beauty and the challenge of the IT profession and or just vent with others, whichever works better on a given night. Um, if any of you might be interested in learning more about it, you can check out our website uh, which is njsim at, at org. Um, or you can reach out to me, flemingc at montclair.edu. We'd love to see you at an upcoming function. Candice, great job. Thanks for uh, being such a great partner over the years. Excellent. Next up, we have Mark Taylor. Mark's the CEO of SIM International. Mark, welcome to the program. You're coming in from Austin. Yeah, Hunter, how are you today? Great, uh, great program you've got lined up and uh, shout out to Candace and the New Jersey team. They've built a great local community uh, in New Jersey and uh, they've, been, they've been a strong community for a really long time. The community is important, right? Uh, you really only know how important it is when you hit a, until when you hit a crisis, right, Mark? Yeah, it really is. I, we certainly encourage uh, our members to, to reach out and build those networks before you ever need them. That certainly isn't a unique concept, but it, boy, does it ring true. Uh, in these uh, times that we've been in, uh, many people have found some shifting uh, in the economy. Many have uh, had greater demands put on them. Many have found themselves in their companies uh, in uh, industries that have been hit hard and uh, are out looking for new opportunities as a result. So these networks uh, matter tremendously and, and open doors that uh, when you really need them. So hey, Candace and the team there, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm looking forward to supporting the foundation yeah. here uh, later next month, as well as uh, our own global event with uh, Seminar International in early December. Yeah, me too, Hunter. Uh, thanks for the, your support on that. We're here with, in New Jersey and also uh, at the event that we're doing uh, for the foundation uh, in, uh, in November and looking forward to working with you for the December event as well. Awesome. Thanks again, Mark. Thank you, sir. Great. So, hey, uh, with our partner Zendesk, we're doing a survey, creating a culture of empathy in uncertain times. You can click in the chat right now and get a link to the survey Fill it out, uh, and essentially, uh, you'll receive a, a free report down the road. Check it out. And our marketplace partners uh, over the uh, year that we've had this, actually three months that we've had the marketplace launch, Appian, Ariaka, Awake, Dark Trace, Forescout, Globon, Obsidian, PagerDuty, Sonotype, Tanium, and Tessian. You can go right to the HMG homepage, click on Marketplace, and learn more about these really cool, innovative companies out of the valley and literally set up a meeting with a. So we're going to do a little uh, survey here, uh, pop-up uh, survey poll. What are, what are your organization's specific technology needs now? If you could fill it out and hit submit, that would be great. And uh, something we're very passionate about here is uh, the top technology executives that matter recognition program. We're going to hold a large gala in early 2021. Uh, we'll be recognizing a couple of folks here. This is a program we've been running now, uh, a recognition program we've been running here at HMG for over 12 years strong. Uh, and we think it's really important to take a time out and recognize people that are doing excellent work, giving back and being connected to the HMG platform network and, as well as SIM. So we'll run a little video here. Later in today's program, HMG Strategy founder and CEO Hunter Muller will proudly recognize and honor global technology executives who matter. These top-tier CIOs, CISOs, and other technology executives have genuinely distinguished themselves in business transformation, digital disruption, innovation, and talent development through even the most difficult circumstances. These awards are not given lightly. They are earned. Recipients join an elite community of forward-thinking global technology executives in the HMG strategy community. We are delighted to celebrate these exemplary leaders and their teams who have delivered unparalleled value to their organizations, their communities, and our world. Please stay with us for the award ceremony and meet the 2020 global technology executives who matter. Excellent. Please stay with us to the end and, uh, and be part of the, the program at the very end of the, uh, today. But first up, we have Clark Golistani. Clark's a good friend of HMG, and we've known each other for quite some time. He's the managing director and advisor, investor, and board member of C-Sensi Group. Clark's got an amazing background, folks, a long career in tech, some 30-plus years in tech and biopharma, both with Oracle and then Merck, most, re most recently as president and CIO at Merck. Uh, and he's transitioned to private equity and venture capital about two and a half years ago. Clark, great to see you and uh, really enjoyed uh, reconnecting over the past month. Hunter, how are you? Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I, I, I didn't know where we were about seven months ago, but uh, we're, we're really uh, pretty happy about delivering demonstrable value with the HMG platform and network and getting messages out thought leadership out, really industry thought leadership out like you. And you've had an amazing career. And talk to us a little bit about, as you looked towards the last five or 10 years of your career, Clark, you had a vision for what you wanted to do next. So what's Clark next up to? How did you plan out in your mind those last few years, set yourself up in such an interesting position right now as an investor and a board member amongst PE? Yeah, so Hunter, I, I got to tell you first, you know, even preparing to get there, um, a platform like uh, you have is so critical for folks to take advantage of. Uh, the amount of networking, uh, and that we heard from our colleagues say earlier, you know, build that network before you need it is just absolutely essential. Uh, I would say that I spent at least uh, three, if not five years, really focused on building that network so that I knew eventually I wanted to transition. 
uh, into doing something. I didn't want to stay, you know, sort of a CIO forever. Um, and in fact, uh, taking on the venture fund at Merck and, and also the solutions division for health uh, accelerated that desire. Um, it, that network is so critical. So I, I, I can't help reinforce more how important it is to build that network across colleagues, across industry, across multiple industries, uh, something that uh, HMG, I think, does an amazing job of helping folks uh, really open those doors. And I don't think as many people take advantage of it. Uh, so, you know, as you know, I attended many of your events and, and leveraged that. Uh, and that was a key, key, really key critical component. And since retiring from Merck, very fortunate uh, to be able to split my time as uh, really a part-time operating partner in private equity, uh, where I really continue my work in, in health and life sciences, uh, focused uh, really on companies at scale. I, I think that health and life sciences really requires scale to really uh, have that impact. Uh, and then uh, I still uh, now spend uh, at least half my time in an area that I love, and that's uh, really new technology startups that are uh, in the core, whether it be in the infrastructure or being able to deliver value uh, to businesses like through analytics and data. You, you've seen transformation over the decades. Uh, what's new now in this innovation and disruption and pandemic that we're looking at right now for the CIO and tech leader? You know, it's funny, uh, Hunter, as I look back and, you know, at Merck, you know, IT was very important and eventually people <clears throat> understood that the value of IT uh, was there and that, wow, digitally engaging uh, with, with uh, customers, patients, or uh, family members and so forth, both to inform better product, uh, to uh, be able to engage the communities and make awareness was important. Um, I think that depending on the industry, you know, clearly in consumer, it was extremely important. Pharma, maybe not as much, but there was energy put behind it. Uh, and maybe technology certainly was an enabler, but you still could put everyone in a room physically to get the meeting done. Uh, you know, so people put in transformation, you know, transformation agents into the business. You know, we saw sort of this, uh, uh, new era of the chief digital officer be born to try to drive organizations. But, you know, I think the greatest chief digital uh, officer that's ever been invented has been COVID. And, you know, there was a lot of work done in the past on, uh, you know, sort of the earnings gap between uh, the technology laggards uh, in industry versus the technology uh, leaders. A lot of work I know done out of MIT Sloan on that, really showing that technology really mattered, data really mattered. But ever since COVID, uh, I think businesses, whether they wanted to or not, they've had to transform digitally. And then those that had sort of that digital edge and were able to exploit it uh, have done so in, in every industry segment. So, you know, I, uh, it's funny, I, I used to say, uh, and I look back and I, I, I now can sort of go, wow, you really didn't see that. I used to say to people, really Amazon, a trillion dollar company, do you really think it's gonna grow beyond a trillion dollar company? Well, it certainly has. Uh, so I think you know, this, this era of uh, COVID has demonstrated how technology is going to play a center role in every organization. And now going forward, the cat's out of the bag. So I think there are gonna be a lot of companies that play catch up, uh, but the reality is, if, you, if, you're not, um, if you're not there technologically in the infrastructure and capability, you're behind. And those that have really learned how to use data and drive analytics to really create differentiated business value, I think those companies are going to win in the end. I'd, I'd almost like to take a, a sort of a, a scorecard index for the Fortune 250, understand where they are in analytics. Uh, and the ability to really leverage data strategically and then map that against earnings and overall share price. And I think we'd see a pretty interesting uh, graph and predictive model be able to emerge from that. Thanks, Clark. What are you most excited about regarding the CIO C-suite and the board? Uh, uh, could you, you broke up, Hunter. Could you say that one more time? What, what excites you the most? Oh, you know, the, I think the, the focus on business transformations and, you know, getting that digital engagement, um, I think that was exciting and building applications that matter. But frankly, what, uh, what excites me the most is the ability to use data today in ways that um, we never thought would be possible. 
Uh, and you know, I see a revolution coming. And when that revolution comes, there were there were a lot of industries I think that were more immune uh, to that that use of data. I, I think about uh, companies that are focused in manufacturing or composition of matter, uh, like biopharmaceuticals or a corning when it comes to different structures of glass and things like that. Um, in the next revolution, uh, I think that um, no industry is immune. I think that data and analytics are going to transform every aspect of every every industry. And I, I tell you, that is, that's hugely exciting. And being able to try to understand who the winners will be, who the losers will be, it just, it, it, it changes the game for everyone. Uh, and I think folks need to really understand what is the current edge of technologies today and how are they going to sort of get a step up uh, you know, over their competitors, much the same as you've seen with Amazon getting that step up across other competitors. Uh, and, you know, not only could all boats rise, but I, I do think we're going to see new winners and, you know, we'll see new winners that may take all uh, and maybe another transformation of the uh, SAP index, as we've seen uh, over history, who's in the Dow and who's in the S&P. I think we're going to see a whole nother revolution over the next decade. Interesting. What about new technologies? What are you watching? Oh, I'll tell you, Hunter. I, uh, I, I, you know, after leaving work, I stepped back and almost built, a, well, I guess being an architect from way back when, an architectural stack uh, and, and looked at each key area and where I thought um, things are going to transform. You know, and I, I got involved with companies in each piece that I thought were going to be the leaders in that area, uh, whether it be the way that you can seamlessly manage storage across uh, you know, uh, cloud versus on-prem with like a silk, uh, that many knew as common area, but now virtualized storage uh, into being able to move data around. Or you know, my real focus area is in analytics, uh, where I've been looking at you know, how will analytics really be driven in the company of the future? And, you know, today, the ability to optimize is just incredible. And I was very fortunate to join the board of uh, Zapata Computing, uh, which is around quantum, which is, you know, the reality is quantum is incredible, uh, but it'll, it'll solve only pieces of the problem. And the real problem is how do you orchestrate all of analytics across an organization to do optimization. In fact, one of the examples we use uh, working with Coke uh, in Japan, uh, where I've heard there are more uh, Coke machines and syrups combined than there is the population. You know, how do you optimize to make sure every Coke machine has just the right amount of syrups, you optimize when they're delivered, you optimize the routes by which they're delivered, and then you build this entire model that optimizes the cost of running the operation and ensures that you're able to drive the revenue to its peak performance. That's something that only, you know, quantum computing will be able to solve in its grandest scale. And then when I look at what it takes to actually execute those projects, uh, it comes down to the data. And, you know, having uh, built a very sizable analytics uh, organization at Merck, uh, you know, what always bothered me was those guys would spend 90% of their time, you know, looking at data, uh, trying to uh, get a hold of the data, transform the data. And, you know, finally after months, you know, all got compiled into a spot where they could finally leverage it to drive analytics. And, you know, I just, as a matter of fact, it was just announced on the board of a new company called Molecula. Uh, so Molecula, uh, they um, now really have a, a feature store, uh, which within, you know, days, you're able to access disparate data bring it together without having to actually move all the data and build data lakes uh, and drive analytics really at the speed of thought, uh, which is to me super exciting, which is why so many companies are quickly adopting uh, their technology. So when you unlock the data and then you're able to compute on that data in completely different ways and solve problems that were uh, unsolvable before, wow, you have the ability to transform complete industries and transform companies. So. I look at the next decade as hugely exciting, and I think we're going to see yet another transformation of you know what has historically uh, changed across the Dow and the S and P. Whole new sets of winners, and unfortunately, uh, whole new sets of losers. Also, hey Clark, great to have you on the program. 
sound, you sound great. Uh, you sound happy as can be. Really good to reconnect with you. And uh, I appreciate your coming in. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Hunter. Thank you very much. Appreciate being here. Take care. Be good. Bye now. Bye now. Hey, next up, we have Christina C.K. Curley. Christina uh, C.K., sorry, is a speaker, futurist, and author, and strategist. For our next speaker, we will have, she's a Fortune 500 keynoter and Rutgers professor. C.K. will discuss survival of the fastest and explore how speed, creativity, and technology are critical, critical for success in the new normal. C.K., welcome. Oh, thank you, Hunter. And I'm so glad we're able to be here today, even virtually, because the big irony right now is that the more we're having to be distanced from one another actually is the biggest time that we need to be together so we can share these best practices, we can share these new developments and advancements. And I know as, as both a professor and a lecturer and a speech giver, I'm being asked about this new normal. In fact, a lot of times I now call it a next normal because what's important to understand is we're going through a series of normals in a very fast clip. And the best way to describe how to both survive and thrive during this time in this pandemic and hopefully quickly coming to post-pandemic reinvention is to really look at how speed, creativity, and technology are going to be critical forces. So if I can go to the next slide, August, I appreciate it. I actually call this pandemic the pandemic paradox. I like what Hunter and what Clark was saying earlier about who's really leading this digital transformation of our companies. And probably my favorite meme, because it rings so true, is this one right here. Was it the CEO? Was it the CTO? And they have circled COVID. On the one hand, pandemic is causing so many of our activities and our plans, heck, the strategy we created at the end of last fiscal year is now not reflecting the world we live in. At the same time, it's pausing so many of our plans, it's actually forcing and speeding our digital transformations. You know, all these technology trends that I've been following and that we've all been talking about and looking for, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Well, we're certainly there. And, and what we're finding is COVID is actually an economic time machine or a supercharging event that's doing two key things. A, it is accelerating the trends that we were already tracking but it's B, compressing those timelines. You know, I, I tell a lot of people when we hearken back to the times of the Spanish flu, what happened right after 1918 and 1919? You had the rocking 20s, a lot of change. So A, work has never changed so much so fast. B, shifts that seem to have taken years. Heck, my doctor is finally offering telemedicine as a course of business and see all of the executives and companies, whether they're new world or traditional companies matters not, all of those executives that were really moving cautiously, understandably, they were saving their, you know, their cash cows are now taking bold moves. I mean, I look back at the AMC and Universal fight from four months ago when they were unleashing movies straight to streaming. So all of these shifts are accelerating and all of the timelines are compressed. And this is important for us to understand both as technologists and executives. And the reason why is because these general purpose technologies, these GPTs that used to take 20 years to take hold, they're now saying that's have. It's gonna take 10 years we're looking more at the next five years. So it's really important to look at speed. And August, if you can transition to the next slide, please. I wanna look at three critical factors. One, obviously speed. Uh, one thing that I always look at is that history has always rewarded the innovators, but it's not been as kind to the laggards. Heck, in the financial crisis of 2008, when we talk about that standard and poor's list, 40%. 40% of the S&P 500 fell from that list. And now that we're looking at this global economic restructuring, it's probably gonna be more like 50%. This can be to our benefit 
if we reimagine and we create and we use technology quickly to restructure and reshape, or it can be to our peril if we don't. So really, number one, speed and how history is rewarding the innovators, not so kind to the laggards. Second, I want to look at creativity. You know, we're talking about reimagining and reshaping, and we're hearing a lot of that these days because of all the disruption, it being so quick. But it's important to understand that creativity, that's going to come from we humans. We really need to look at creativity and imagination, not as a luxury during these, these difficult times. It's absolutely essential because now we're really looking at human and machine civilizations, which brings me to my third point and technology. It used to be when I started in technology 25 years ago, it used to be that technology was looked at, and we all know this well, as a quote unquote enabler. Not anymore. Why? Now it's more of a collaborator. It used to be that technology would help us to create things faster, easier, and more cheaply. But now technology is a true collaborator because it's helping us open up entirely new sources of profits, which I'll go through. It's helping us to revolutionize business models. And it's not just giving us information like Clark was talking about, but through advanced analytics, data, all of that, it's giving us key insights. So I wanna go through these three. And this is really coming down to the big word of relevance. We wanna make sure that we are relevant in this short period. Heck, the last six months, doesn't it seem like we've had six years of change? We wanna make sure that we're staying relevant and we wanna make sure that we are helping to reshape the industries. So let's start with speed. August, can you go ahead? Thank you. So why, in essence, does speed equal survival? I go to three keys here, first and foremost, and this is really easy for us to understand because we can check ourselves. While our customers may be technically the same as they were six months ago, think about it, their priorities, their needs, their behaviors, and their purchasing preferences have completely changed. And that's just within a handful of business quarters. So we need to make sure that we're not just attracting new customers, but holding on to our customers who completely changed. And think about this over the next day, the next week, the next month, of how much your needs, your priorities, your actions and behaviors have changed, and you can really see that. Second is new timelines. You know, I call it a hashtag expectation economy, and here's the reason why. Not only are we looking at amazing advancements on vaccines that will quickly come in 2021, but we're looking at this happening at warp speed. Heck, the actual program is called Operation Warp Speed. But that expectation, now that we'll see things are possible, once the world focuses on a problem, makes a commitment to that, that's not just going to be in biopharmaceuticals and healthcare. That expectation is going to bleed across everything. As I tell my students at Rutgers, now that we have mobile devices where we can go ahead and have the entire information and world in our hand and get everything quickly, that expectation of I want what I want when I want it is across all facets of our life, both professional and personal. So number two, the speed there is going to be these expectations are going to affect everything, no matter if we are B2B, B2C, B2G, heck, B2E. And here's a third key. The new tech is opening up entirely new competitors. You know, it used to be that domain expertise was the number one facet we would look at, and that's still important. But now we look at universal capabilities and understanding how to aggregate data, how to analyze that for insights, how to couple companies and be able to extract value in between them. And that means that it's not just the usual suspects that can encroach on our land. Take automotive. You know, automotive, we're not just looking at the car companies, have other car companies as competitors and trends as competitors, but also companies that were never traditionally automotive, whether it's Alphabet's Waymo with autonomous vehicles or whether it's Uber with the ride sharing services. 
So all of these companies that understand these universal capabilities, they can easily encroach into new spaces. It also opens up a lot of opportunities. You know, I say that Domino's Pizza, Domino's is a tech company now that just happens to serve pizza because of all of the advancements it's made. Look at agriculture, John Deere. John Deere Equipment is as much a software company as it is a hardware company, so it has a new set of competitors. So these three are really key. It's not just technology, it's not just the pandemic accelerating the trends, but it's also how our customers have changed and how our expectations are changing. Let's look at creativity next. If we can go to the next slide, thank you. So I say creativity is a necessity, not a luxury. You know, when we're looking at hard numbers and we're looking at data and information, it's easy to get caught up in technology we need to serve. Nope, it needs to serve us. It really is collaborative. I even call with robots, I call them cobots, collaborative robots, because we are working together. But it's so important to understand while we have so many headlines that are talking about jobs being taken over and we get really nervous about what we can't do as well as machines, Actually, it's two types of intelligences working together, which is what's so great. But the creativity is so important. What I just talked about with customers changing and expectations changing, also look at needs. The needs are here on the right, not just getting a pizza and creating meals, but having a home-based activity during this time, we're really needing to isolate more and something the family can enjoy or couples can enjoy. Heck, Macy's, right now, Macy's is doing more pickup and drive up and e-commerce delivery, but it's featuring more what? Home-based home -based fashion than personal fashion, because we really are now looking back at improving our homes because we're spending so much time there. To even a company as new as Uber. You know, when Uber was on the scene, it was right after the 08 financial crisis when we had a change of needs from our customers and expectation from owning an asset, a car, to having access to sharing rides with Uber. Now Uber is finding it's not just transporting people to restaurants, but restaurant food to people through Uber Eats. So that creativity is really what helps us reimagine our business and when I talked about relevance earlier, a big thing here is this. When these hard times hit or change and disruption hits, it's very easy to feel out of control. But when you're reimagining, you're actually helping to reshape the industry you're in. And that's very helpful for employees overall and obviously for the success and the ongoing um, business of your industry. So let's look at technology. We go to the next slide. Thank you. I talked earlier about three areas, speed, creativity, and now technology. The big change with the technologies we now have, you know, I call them next generation technologies. We can look at intelligence era and intelligent technologies. The big change here is they've gone from an enabler, making things faster, cheaper, easier, to an all out collaborator. And the reason being here is threefold as well. You know, there's a real big misconception when it comes to AI, advanced analytics, big data and the like, that these technologies actually do what we do better and we can rely on them and they'll take the front seat. Yeah, I thought I heard something. But actually what it is, is that they're giving us entirely new insights and the biggest advancement and the biggest asset here is they're thinking unlike us, not like us and better and faster, but unlike us, you know, the old adage, think outside the box. These technologies are really helping to reinvent the way we invent, whether it's in biotech, whether it's nanotech or whether it's material science, they're showing us these insights. And second, what's really interesting about these collaborative technologies, they help us to create new profits and get out of the zone we were in. I'll give you two famous examples. First, Amazon. Amazon on the retail end started out as a service provider, but now with all of these technologies, 
it's gone to more products with Amazon Echo, with the Kindle and the like. And on the flip side, Apple started out as a product provider. But you know what? Apple's uh, music as well as Apple TV are making more profits as subscription services than sales of their iPad. So they're not doing too bad there. Another interesting thing was, what did Apple come out with yesterday? They have made the switch to 5G easily two to three years ahead of schedule. Why? Welcome to this new normal and this next normal, where we are looking at, again, accelerating these tech trends and compressing the timelines. And third, and I'm gonna end here with some examples on the next slide, is that these collaborative technologies are actually helping us to, to transform and revolutionize our business models, whether it's everything from precision agriculture. You know what? Used to be they used 20 times, 20 times more pesticide in a spray and pray, but now machine vision just helps them de decide what's a weed and what's healthy. To personalizing things like education, you know, there is a big sobering joke that if you took a doctor from 100 years ago and you dropped him to a hospital today, he'd faint. There have been so many advancements. Take a teacher from 100 years ago, drop him into a school today, pick up a piece of chalk, go to the chalkboard and start teaching. It hasn't changed enough, but through big data and AI collaborating for personalization, guess what? We can have each and every kid's homework and study map to their skills, their needs, their strengths, and better the engagement. Remember Netflix way back when you used to get DVDs by mail, or heck, it was streaming great movies, not any longer. Now we go to Netflix to see originals, and all of those great movies then bring back data, and the value circle begins anew. Because these are collaborative technologies, I want to show two other examples before I close. One is I've been living between both coasts of New York and California for the last year. And so one thing I have become very much in tune to is wildfires. I love what I am seeing with technologies like Descartes, the startup that's able to, through satellites, crunch this data and look at the images and spot fires within nine minutes what would usually take hours and hours. That's really important when we're looking at a collaborative technology to save lives and stop fires into becoming massive wildfires. It's something we can all relate to, which is in health and preventing illness. You know, probably my favorite saying is when you're healthy, you got a million problems. You know, you want to lose five pounds, your husband's driving you crazy, you have a debt, but when you're sick, you have one problem because you want to stay healthy. What we're finding is that with these collaborative technologies, they can help us to find, until we can eradicate cancers, they're helping us to find it earlier and earlier in stages where they're absolutely manageable. Again, because we have this collaborative technology that can crunch through all this data. You know, uh, one startling statistic is when ovarian cancer is caught in stage one, 95%, 95% survival rate. When it's caught in stage three, 5%. So these collaborative technologies, whether it's agriculture, whether it's education, entertainment, automotive, wildfires, healthcare, are really collaborating with us to find new sources of profit, as well as to be able to transform our business model. So when it all comes down to it, we're looking at a time where we have this paradox of everything accelerating and compressing, and we're needing to reimagine and reshape faster. We need to look at speed. We need to look at creativity, human imagination, and we need to look at these technologies as true collaborators. Hey, CK, uh, great okay. job. You, you really nailed it. Really impressive. Thanks oh, thank so you. much. You're um, absolutely welcome. How can people get in touch with you? Well, um, they can easily go to allthingsck.com. Get it? Allthingsck.com. Or I'm over at Twitter at CK Says. 
I also am over at LinkedIn, so you can find me. And I don't have to twist my arm to geek out on technology, but I thank you for letting me have, a, have this many minutes of uh, time, and I hope that it's been valuable to the audience as well. You nailed it. Really tight presentation. Love to have you on. Really, uh, really uh, excited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Great recommendation from the advisory board. So really appreciate it, CK. Be well, yes. and we'll see you soon. Absolutely. Excellent. Next up, we have Mark Polanski. Mark's the senior partner of the technology officer, officer's practice at Corn Ferry. Mark's going to talk about self-disrupt or be disrupted, introducing the self-disruptive leader. Mark, welcome to the program. Thank you, Hunter, and um, shout out and best uh, wishes to all my uh, Sydney, New Jersey friends and to all our guests. <clears throat> this uh, concept of the self-disruptive leader, uh, the, search, uh, the, the uh, uh, research was actually uh, conducted in 2019, but as I've been presenting uh, this material over the last several months, uh, we've come to realize that it's even more important uh, during the uh, pandemic. So. Uh, this is all about leaders who can uh, adapt and collaborate and drive uh, their organizations uh, to success in disruptive times. Um, just by way of background, uh, where does this research come from? Uh, many of you know that Corn Ferry is in these five areas of um, uh, expertise, uh, talent acquisition or executive search. The middle one is where I sit, and that is our core and traditional business and remains. So. But additionally, the uh, Corn Ferry has um, funded the Corn Ferry Institute, which is a non-for-profit uh, research organization, which is the beneficiary of a lot of data that the firm generates. Every time we interview somebody, every time somebody interviews with a client, every time we do an assessment or an engagement or a, or a uh, uh, succession uh, study or a data survey, all of that data gets captured with the original big data firm uh, in the HR space. And uh, we've got a lot of data, as you can see. So this data is what uh, the Corn Ferry Institute operates on and produces research from. Um, additionally, every year we do uh, what's called the Corn Ferry 1000, which is a, a survey of uh, CXOs, um, uh, board directors, investors, uh, and, and uh, trying to spot trends uh, in, uh, in business. And uh, this is from the 2019 survey, uh, more than 80% of those uh, 1,000 uh, execs told us uh, that they are face-to-face -face, uh, with disruption and uh, it's becoming harder and harder to manage uh, their investments uh, and their operations. Uh, over 60% of the same group said, they're not sure where the competition is going to come from. It's just too easy to say it's going to come from Amazon, but it is coming from other digital native companies and companies like uh, Tesla, who are becoming more traditional, but started from a digital uh, point of view. Um, what we did then was look into the database and see who's succeeding, uh, which companies are um, leading the pack, and, and what, is their, uh, what do their leadership models look like and how do their executives lead? And what's very, very clear from the research is that the command and control uh, leadership model, think BE, think Honeywell, et cetera, uh, are, are outdated uh, and those companies need to shift and pivot uh, in order to stay current. So the premise of the self-disruptive leader is, uh, as, uh, uh, as Clark has said and CK said, if we can disrupt business models, um, entire companies, entire industries, and even entire countries, uh, think India, et cetera, um, why can't we or why shouldn't we be disrupting ourselves? Uh, we skip right over what we need to do to change and pivot. And so uh, the concept of the self-disruptive leader uh, came about. Um, then the uh, researchers, and these are primarily PhDs in organizational psychology, uh, go back into the data and say, okay, how are these leaders, how are the winners um, leading uh, in, a self, in a disruptive economy, a disruptive time? Uh, and here are uh, the insights, the, the five key attributes of self-disruptive leaders that our researchers found. The first one is anticipate. 
Um, this is the ability to see around corners, as we say, uh, to provide some clarity uh, during times of disruption, during times of volatility, and certainly during times of ambiguity. And remember, this is 2019 research, and just think about anticipation in the context of, of the COVID pandemic. Uh, the next is the ability to drive, uh, to create a positive environment in which experimentation, in which um, models can be tried, in, in which pilots can be activated to fail safe uh, and, and fail quick. Um, energizing people, getting people jazzed about what they're doing and provide this wonderful environment in which smart people uh, can excel. Uh, thirdly, uh, acceleration. We've heard from uh, CK a lot about time today, and we know that uh, first mover advantage, which uh, was a phrase coined 20 years ago in, in the dot-com time, uh, is even more important today because there are so many people uh, trying new things in so many places where competition will come from. Uh, so the need for speed is is never has never been more important. Driving prototyping um, and um, uh, also managing and controlling the flow of knowledge to make sure that knowledge in your organization reaches the right people uh, and uh, remains secure and private. Uh, fourthly. Uh, the ability to partner. This is ex ex exceptionally important today where you're leading inter interdisciplinary teams of people that, yes, some report to you and some don't. Um, how do you get their, uh, their commitment? How do you find uh, the energy and the uh, enthusiasm and the excitement uh, to partner across your organization and that's internally, of course, as well as externally. And last but not least amongst the five uh, is the uh, element of trust. Uh, trust uh, here is, is the biggest uh, speed uh, accelerator because if I can trust you, if I have trust in what I expect from you and that you will deliver to the quality I expect, then I don't have to waste time worrying about you or checking up on you. Uh, so the speed of trust is critically important and that works in the other direction. The other teammates, uh, the other folks in the leadership team that you uh, collaborate with need to trust you. There's a book here that I'll reference as one of the best books I've read in a long, long time by Stephen Covey and it's called The Speed of Trust. And the premise is just that how he's able to, or people who are, are uh, uh, trustworthy, are, are able to accelerate and, and increase the speed of the trajectory of innovation and success. Um, so uh, what does ADAPT mean? Oh, I should mention that our marketing people are having fun with the letters across the top. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, in order to adapt, we know that we have to be agile. Um, many of you heard, have heard me talk about uh, learning agility as a key to success. Uh, but agility, we know, is a trait. It's not a skill. It's not something that can be learned like playing the piano. It's something that only changes slowly over time because a trait requires changing one's mindset. And this is critical because the way to practice and the way to become agile is not in any skill acquisition it's in changing the way we think, uh, the way we believe, and the assumptions that we're going to make. So in, in summary, uh, takeaways for the self-disruptive leader, um, disruptive times in 2019, and even more so in 2020, make traditional leadership obsolete. Uh, success means striving to adapt and to collaborate both internally and externally in order to excel. Uh, the ADAPT uh, acronym is there for you. Uh, and remember that agility is a trait, not a skill. Uh, so uh, one needs to change one's mindset to become agile enough to uh, adapt and become a self-disruptive leader. Um, so the charge for today, uh, develop yourself, work on your own agility, um, practice a, the ADAPT model. And then uh, when you think you know what that's all about, uh, identify and develop your self-disruptive leadership team 
uh, so that they can be uh, on the uh, same uh, page with you as you all move forward and, uh, and succeed. Uh, as the slide says, resources are available uh, on our website. Uh, there is a 120 page report that backs up this 10 minute presentation. Uh, and it's there, it's available. All the Point Perry Institute research is online and free. Uh, and so uh, uh, don't uh, hesitate to take advantage of that. Hunter, anticipating a question of how people can reach me, there's my information, and I welcome uh, all inquiries. Hey, Mark, great to see you, and uh, great job on the presentation. Thank you, Hunter. Thank you. Stay safe. Next up, next up, we have leading digital innovation in a highly distributed environment. Uh, let's welcome the panel. Uh, you can turn your uh, cameras on. That'd be great. Uh, Maury Cuppet from uh, Sonotype. Maury is the VP of Solutions Architect. Maury, welcome to the program. Hi, good afternoon. Hey, look, things are changing at an incredible speed right now. Never have we seen more uh, forced innovation and more of a survival scenario than ever. When you think about your customers, what are the biggest challenges that you're helping them with now? Well, it's really to, to leverage the tools and the processes uh, that they have in place already, right? CK mentioned it, um, a lot of the, the process is there. So uh, customers are leveraging open source components uh, so that if we look at speed and creativity, they can focus that creativity on the business, right? So um, we wanna go faster, uh, we wanna develop uh, competitive uh, differentiation, uh, and we're using open source components. So we have to do that securely. Uh, we have to do it in a way that the developer is not bogged down by process. Um, it, again, it's all about, as you said, the speed of, of which we can develop the, the innovative software. And how do you help uh, your clients win? Yeah, it, what we're doing is um, allowing the developers to take more ownership of the open source components that they're using, right? Pick the good components that help them accelerate their delivery of value to the customer by shifting that left, giving them visibility into, um, into problems, into security issues where they can fix this quickly, right? We don't want to have rework. We don't want to have remediation. All of our lead time spent on, on those two things. We want them to be able to, to pick the right components and be able to focus on the problem of the business, which is delivering value to the customer. Interesting times, right? Yeah. So if you need to move faster as an organization, why does slowing down sometimes make sense? Yeah, uh, slowing down to uh, take a look at the processes that were in place. And if we're gonna, uh, if we're gonna use open source components, the other piece of this in the DevOps world is automation. And slowing down and taking a look at what we have in place currently, how can we leverage that Active Directory instance? How can we leverage that LDAP uh, instance to help my teams move across applications? Um, we're all having to do more with less. And, and a lot of that is bringing developers up to speed around a new project, but that means onboarding and, and securities and roles. And so slow down, see what you have in place to help automate that and make it easier to onboard those uh, developers between applications. Excellent. This will, I'll circle back to you in just a minute. Yeah. Next up, we have Dutt Kalori. Dutt's the Senior Vice President uh, oh, and Senior Vice President of Global Technology at Broadridge. Dutt? Hi, Hunter. Great to see you. Good seeing you, too. So what, how, how did the pandemic push your innovation agenda forward? See, there are a few areas. See, first of all, as a financial services fintech, uh, with the need to rapidly and quickly process the financial instruments, whether it is trade or post-trade, the, the need to automate and the need to innovate is extremely urgent and important for us to deliver better, faster, cheaper, and secure. Now, with that said, the pandemic actually helped us disrupt the way we work because as we transition from working from a location to working remotely, changing and transforming our architectures from an enterprise perspective to an individual perspective and building a workspace around that individual 
whether it is collaboration tools, communication tools, transaction tools, and provide the security at that endpoint level has forced us to be innovative and bring in those changes rapidly and you know to deliver our solutions better, faster, cheaper, and secure. Okay. So you know, continuity of services, a secure enterprise is important. How are you ensuring a secure continuity enterprise with continuity of services? So from a security perspective, we adapted a zero trust framework, Hunter. And we are not allowing any concept of bring your own device. Everything is provided by the firm so that we know what is in there, what is sitting on the machine, and we are controlling that. And those are some of the strategies that are helping us provide the continuity and scalability and security to our customers. Thanks, Dud. You know, this was an unprecedented crisis that we went through. What was the toughest thing for you to for you to lead through in this crisis? What was the toughest decision or experience you had to make a decision on? Well, you know, on the contrary, technology was not a major issue, Hunter. It's the people that was the toughest issue for us. Making sure that my teams had the highest morale levels, delivering, continue to deliver that value. So what was important for us was to relook at the way we delivered our services and solutions to our customers. Rather than becoming a task oriented, we became outcomes oriented. So switching from the task oriented mindset to an outcome based was the biggest change or shift in mindset that we had to bring in. And you know this, change management is not easy, right? It's the fear of unknown that prevents the humanity to adapt to change. And we had to address that fear of unknown to make sure that we empathize with our people. And as leaders, we had to transform ourselves as the custodians of the values that we put in there in our teams to enable them on a global platform, on a global digital platform. And yeah, that really great job. Uh, really uh, hit me right in the heart there. It's, uh, it's all about the people, isn't it, right? Yes, absolutely. Stay with us. I'll circle back to you in just a minute. Next, next up, we have Justin Lawler from uh, Delta Dental. He's the CIO. Justin, great to see you again. Good afternoon, Hunter. Hey, you know, pivoting off of what Dutch just mentioned, culture matters, right? And the shift associated to these virtual distributed teams, what were the issues that you led through and how, how did it play out for you and your organization? Yeah, I think, you know, the old term culture eat strategy for lunch is out there, right? And I think it's fitting in that, uh, you know, you could have the best strategy in place. And when COVID-19 hit, uh, all things were on the table. And as we shifted to a full remote workforce, you know, a lot of our focus had to be helping uh, move culture really quick in the business units, right? As a technology leader, our technology folks had been working remotely or in, in hybrid mode for many years, but really uh, sitting down with the business uh, stakeholders and understanding the jobs they normally did on premises uh, and how we could enable those jobs to be performed uh, you know, remotely was a big focus. And it, it's all about blurring the lines between technology and business. I think, you know, if COVID's done anything, you know, in addition to, to moving uh, the digital pace of things forward, it's really uh, moved forward that blurring of the lines between technology and business. And, and that's what I've seen the most is that the culture change across the organization has been the blurring of those lines where it's one team. It's no longer the business team and the technical team. It has to be one team to enable the, the culture change. Well, it's interesting. You put a crisis in play, right? Uh, all of a sudden, any healthy organization responds, we're, we're going to survive, right? It's Darwinian. Maybe survive and win. What were the wins that you had, Justin? I think uh, we were able to leverage uh, some technologies we had brought in, quite frankly, before COVID-19 and really react to some of our key stakeholders. As a, as a dental insurer, you know, our providers are an important uh, partner group for us. Uh, and, and they were in distress. Uh, they had mandated shutdowns from the governors uh, in, in many of the states. And so we were able to very quickly put together a short-term loan program, as well as, you know, uh, payments for their protective equipment. Uh, 
uh, and put that all in place very quickly through agile process, processes, collaborating both with the business uh, and, and others. Uh, you know, also the investment in data and analytics let us really understand what was happening in real time through the data. What did our claims volumes look like? What did our call center look like, et cetera? And understand when we were coming out of that trough as things started to open back up and, you know, have we returned to the, to the new normal yet? Uh, I, I think, you know, the, the jury's still out. Excellent. Hey, Justin, stay with me. I'll be back to you in just a minute. Uh, next up, we have Joe Puglisi. Joe's the VP of IT at NicePack Products, Inc. Joe, good to see you. Hey, it's great to be here, Hunter. Tell me, what is new? What's, what's up? What's, what's, what's up in your post-pandemic, let's call it post-pandemic world? Let's, let's go forward. I, I think the thing you have to be concerned about is, is, is uh, uh, a lot of people have pointed out, the change in culture to accommodate operating a business when everyone is working out of their house. You know, no, no one could have seen it coming, Hunter, but we, we started to tell people in early March to think about taking their notebooks home, think about taking important files and making them virtual instead of physical. And uh, that has been a, an ingredient for success. The business is able to operate uh, and, and we are doing quite well now. Interesting times, right? Uh, who'd ever thought uh, that we'd be in this situation, Joe? Uh, any innovation that you helped the, the business with during this time? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that you can imagine as, as a manufacturer of disinfecting wipes, uh, demand for our product went through the roof and it was impossible for humans to keep up with managing all of the changes to the orders as we got into uh, really having to manage who was going to get what and when. So we brought in an RPA technology, something we'd been talking about for years, but never had the motivation. Well, COVID-19 came in and gave us a good swift kick in the butt. Uh, and we put in some RPA solutions that managed those customer orders. We got it done in about six days. Oh, fascinating stuff. And you found increased productivity. Well, it was, it was not only increased productivity, but it was keeping us from drowning in the orders, uh, which were just coming in at a ferocious pace. And how does it work, uh, the uh, robot? Oh, it's, it's, it's really interesting stuff because we do have rather an archaic uh, ERP system, but the customer service, uh, actually the marketing people were looking at which customers needed what products and prioritizing. And then we just fed that into this robotic process, which literally mimicked the keystrokes necessary to go into that older ERP platform, adjust the order quantities, record what it did so we had audit trails and we could review it. And then uh, it you know, clicked the, uh, the big red button that said, okay, ship the stuff and the way it went. Fascinating stuff, Joe. Hey, stay with us. I'll circle back to you here in just a minute. Let's go back to Maury. Hey, Maury, we talked about the need to slow down. Let's click, double click down on that again. Give us an example of a process that can benefit from a slowdown in order to optimize the automation. Yeah, I, I think I mentioned it um, uh, earlier, the, the whole idea of onboarding and, and really enabling the development teams uh, to move uh, between projects in a secure way, right? So can I slow down and take a look at uh, the process that, that I have in place to onboard new employees, uh, as well as uh, new projects, right? Um, there was a trend for um, kind of self-service automation around uh, project development and new project initiatives. So if, if you really want to innovate fast, uh, give teams the ability to, to fire up a brand new project and all the security around it um, just on the fly, right? So uh, as you start to look at that and incorporate that in, um, the speed increases as you slow down. Um, the other thing personally that I've done with, with my team is uh, have a slow down and, and focus on kind of our own personal education, right? So we actually uh, have two four hour blocks, two three hour blocks um, uh, a week where uh, we get together if we can, if we're not on, on meetings and really talk about how we're making ourselves better, how uh, the product's changing and, and really taking that time to understand how we could go faster um, right by slowing down and, and focusing on again uh, the people become important there too. When you think of Sonotype, what should people what should people think of? 
Um, people need to think about speed of delivering product uh, 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 products to uh, their customers by using open source components. You're using um, hundreds of thousands of open source components in the, the software that you're building every day. Uh, just focus on the continued continuous need to use those software to find uh, automated processes to bring that uh, open source software in and make sure it's secure. Excellent. Stay with us more. We'll circle back to you. Uh, hey, Dot, circling back to you. Um, you know, I, we often, I often say that this crisis has allowed the CIO to flex his or her muscles to reimagine, and reinvent the go-to-market to help the company and the business business reinvent new business models. What have you done uniquely different uh, at Broadridge to facilitate, enable, and lead new business model creation? Great question, uh, Hunter. As we evolved as a technology, uh, as a global fintech, the way we went to the market has changed, right? What I mean by that is we used to go to market as investor communication services and global technology and operations. We changed that and started going to the market as market segments, which is wealth management, capital markets, investment management, corporate actions, and a slew of other market segments that we operate. In. Aligned technology was critically important. What that meant was reimagining the core of how we do business, the core of how the services are rendered on my platforms. We had to start componentizing it and start rendering these components as services on a everything as a service platform. And once we started looking at APIs and microservices, that changed the way we charged our, our uh, our customers. The business model or the revenue model for us has changed from regular payments to pay per use. And that was a big, big change and boost in the way our, our organization evolved. That's an example. The other thing is, I know Joe touched on uh, robotic process automation. The robotic process automation or the RPA bots played a critical role in increasing the throughput and efficiency of our process also. We use two main products, UiPath and Automation Anywhere. And we created these bots in the lab, trained them the way we train our new employees, onboarded them, credentialized them, and released them into the environment. And that has actually increased the speed of processing. In fact, we established that the productivity of three humans is equal to one bot, which means we had enhanced our shop capacity to process the end-to-end -end procedures with, with very heightened quality. And the third thing was to increase automation. See, the most important thing in any digital transformation is digital transformation is not just technology modernization. It's the new way of thinking. And in that new way of thinking and building that, what I call the physical world, or the physical environment, the state between digital and physical, it's extremely important to put together those automated components or the foundational components that can be reused, leveraged. By the way, at Broadridge, we call them Legos. And these are the building blocks for my digital environment or digital infrastructure that will enable my business to be flexible, rapid. And in my opinion, that's the difference between saying agile, being agile, and doing agile. And we think we are between doing agile and being agile. That brings in the business agility. That's the technology innovation that we provided to our business to transform them, to change them, and adapt to the new environment, the new normal. And we call that ready for next. Love it. I think there's a session there we should follow up there, Doug. That's brilliant. Uh, one follow-up question. How do you educate the business to accept the new IT value proposition? See, the first and foremost thing that we did is, again, you know, nothing against technologists, but technology speak technology. And the business speaks English. And we came up with a long language called Teclish. 
which explains technology in English. Nice. And we looked at the outcomes, we looked at the advantages, we looked at the benefits and started articulating them in business value and business terms. And that got the buy-in from our businesses. So, you know, the, 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 the question was, hey, transform, become digital and be a disruptor. Otherwise you'll have a Kodak moment. Excellent, I uh, really appreciate uh, the insights. Love it, thank you. Hey, Justin, back to you. You know, during a crisis, people often get really short-term focused. How do you get people to think more strategically and stay focused on the long run? <clears throat> yeah, I think in crises is even more, you know, people get focused on the, uh, you know, they get the tunnel vision, they're focused on the problem or the crisis and they start to lose sight of the future. And I think one of the uh, responsibilities as a, as a technology leader all the time, not just in a time of crisis, is to force people to kind of take a step back and look at what's happening in the industry, specifically around the way uh, both technology uh, is being applied and cultures are being changed in organizations in order to do things faster. I think we heard speed a lot today. Um, and so, you know, I find that, you know, getting my executives together uh, and almost, you know, saying, all right, forget about the tactical focus that you have right now. All of us have tactical focus. Let's talk about what we see some of the, the leaders and some of the under, other industries doing. What do we think folks are going to look to do? How have the priorities changed to the, to the uh, first presenter's comments on priorities have changed? And let's start to map out that strategic roadmap uh, because, uh, you know, specifically, we've done this quite a bit with our sales folks because they're very tactically focused on sales goals and numbers. Um, and this has been very impactful for them because they can't go out to lunch anymore and entertain folks or communicate with folks as they did. Uh, and really pulling them back and saying, how are you going to sell in the future? How, how are brokers and general agents and large groups and consultants going to want to interact with you so that we can start to get our head around what technologies and processes we need to enable for you to be able to to sell in the future rather than just being focused on, are you meeting this year's sales goals? So it really is about uh, making, uh, you know, an explicit request for people to step out of their current day-to-day -day firefighting um, and, and think about how do we want to approach this, you know, in the long term. And when I say long term these days, that's 12 to 18 months. It's no longer three-year long term. So uh, it, it's just driving that conversation. And I think as technology leaders, we have a responsibility to do that. You know, Justin, you seem like a people kind of person. You really care about your people and your uh, organization, right? Absolutely. How do you how do you inspire them and keep them focused and uh, knowing that you got their back, them knowing you got their back and uh, keeping them engaged? Yeah, I mean, I've always subscribed to servant leadership. Uh, and so I'm all about how can I enable my employees to experiment and explore, learn new skills uh, and apply them. Uh, and I think encouraging the, them to take tries, it's about decentralization, right? It's not about me as a CIO, it's about decentralizing uh, authority to the entire team so they feel empowered to take those chances and so that they understand how they need to communicate with a business stakeholder and so that they make their own mistakes and fail forward. Uh, but I think that's the most important. And once you start to do that and drive that into your culture, that trust factor gets huge, not only with your employees, but with the business. And, and that's when you've got the capital internally to start to do some more advanced projects. And when you go and say, hey, we want to do something with AI or machine learning, you know, everyone's all in, your team's all excited because you've built that trust uh, with all the stakeholders in the organization. Nice, excellent. Stay with us, Justin, I'll circle back to you. Uh, hey, Joe, over to you. You know, you've been uh, always impressed me. We've worked, collaborated together for over 20 years, I think, in different forms and on a board together. Uh, you seem to me, you really figured out this leadership style early on in your career. You were a, for, a Fortune 500 CIO. Uh, and what is, what is the secret to your leadership style over the decades? Well, that, that, that's, a, that's a great question. I'll, I'll tell you, you can read in my blog, Hunter, that I've, I've got three rules uh, that everyone should subscribe to if they work with me. And I don't talk about people working for me. I talk about people working with me. And the first rule is that when something goes wrong, I want to be the first to know. And I want to be the first to know so that we're prepared to learn from the mistake and not repeat 
repeat the mistake. It's not to chastise anybody or, or to, uh, uh, you know, punish them for having made an error. You learn by your mistakes, and that, that's what I'd like to see. I like to see learning. Uh, second is my whole philosophy about technology is important. I think we've heard a lot of speakers today reiterate this perspective that technology is important, but it's all about the business. The business is why we're there. It, it, it's not for the servers and the routers. It's to sell product. It's to provide services. It's to meet customer demand. So um, let's make sure that we prioritize appropriately when we're doing our technology initiative. And third, and, and uh, probably most important, your opinion matters. My staff know that if they have a point of view, even if it's contrary to where I'm taking them, they, they're not afraid to voice it, believe me. They're not afraid to voice it. I always tell them, you know, you guys don't want to follow me over a cliff, so let's, let's make sure we have healthy dialogues. And I may have the final say, but I'm still interested in, in hearing what other people's opinions are. So those are my three rules. Awesome, love it. Thanks, Joe. And, uh, Today, Joe, is it the best time ever to be a tech leader? You know, it is absolutely the best time ever. Who was it that said there were three drivers? I think it was uh, in, in uh, CK's presentation, was it? Uh, the, the, the CIO, uh, no, no, sorry, the, the CEO, the CFO, and then COVID-19. Well, COVID-19 has really changed the playing surface, and, and uh, I'm enjoying being in charge of technology when technology has become so important to the life of all businesses. Excellent, Joe. Great to see you. And we'll see you at the rec in the recognition program uh, at the very end of the summit. Thanks for being here. Hey, Maury, uh, kind of final word. When you think about uh, the innovation cycle we're in right now and your clients and being a tech leader, exciting time? It, it, incredibly exciting time, right? Uh, being able to to move so fast. Again, I, again, I think it was CK that, that mentioned we've had – these policies in place, we've been doing DevOps, we've been doing Agile, we've had this ability to move forward and um, having COVID push that forward yeah, really done. makes it easier. Done. So um, I, it's a great time to be in this business. Awesome. Uh, Dut, final word, uh, great time to be a tech leader? Absolutely, Hunter. The changing environment, the changing dynamics and the changing world and the new normal, so to say. Ability to drive the speed, scope, and impact. And the ability to influence the humanity as such from a technology perspective, I think is a great opportunity. And while we talk about digital, while we talk about bots, while we talk about hybrid environments, I think being human is very important at this point in time. And yes, being a technology leader is a great opportunity in these times. Excellent. Great to see you, Doug. Thanks for being here. And finally, Justin, uh, final word. Yeah, I think, you know, being a change agent my whole career at Delta Dental has, has always been what, what, what's driven me forward. And, you know, the, I think the best thing about COVID-19 for me is it's made me feel really uncomfortable. And whenever I feel really uncomfortable, it's an opportunity to grow and learn. And I think it's really, you know, we have to be careful what we wish for as, as technology executives. And we, I wish everyone would use Zoom. I wish everyone would use MS Teams and embrace uh, bot technology and want to use AI and ML. And well, okay, we just did what we would normally do in five years and six months. And, you know, it's only getting faster. And so great, I think it's a great time to be in, in technology. You're the center of the change. You've likely got the C CEO, if not the chairman of the board's ear. And you know the future is really yours to, to help map out with them. Uh, and they're gonna need help along the way. This, this, this expedited change that occurs ha has got them on their heels, uh, unless they're technology executives themselves that have moved into those leadership roles. Justin, great job. Maury, thanks for coming on the program. Dutt, thank you. Joe, really appreciate it. Gentlemen, hopefully you can stay for the rest of the summit. Really appreciate your engagement. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Excellent. Hey, next up, we have the HMG Innovation Accelerator, an inside look at cool new tech. First up is Rudy Arahu, VP of Marketing of Awake Security. Rudy, welcome uh, to the program. Good to see you. Hey, Hunter. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks to the audience as well. Hey, a Greylock company, right? Greylock backed, and uh, you got some news, right? 
Yeah, yeah, we uh, we were yeah we were incubated actually within Greylock. Ashim Chan, uh, who's uh, you know storied investor, uh, Palo Alto Networks among other uh, places, and uh, we just uh, got acquired uh, by Arista Networks. So we've kind of moved to the next part of our of our journey now as part of a you know multi billion dollar company. You know, Rudy, you have a, a, a saying that uh, every threat is an insider threat. Uh, that sounds a little controversial in terms of the positioning. What exactly do you mean by that? Yeah, you know, and, and uh, you know, look, I think part, part of the, the message we're trying to get across is that, you know, these days, uh, if you look at the way most threat actors operate, you know, it's not the kind of your traditional malware anymore, right? The way they're coming in is really by stealing the usernames, the passwords of your legitimate users. And so once they have that, they're really operating like an insider, right? And, and if your, your entire security policy and security program is focused on keeping the quote unquote bad people out, you know, you're going to struggle, right? Because, because the, the, you know, in, in many ways, it's now your insider privileges that are being used and abused. And so that's kind of really what the point that we're kind of trying to get across is that it's time to kind of rethink how your security program is organized. So what does Awake essentially do? What do you help the enterprise uh, do in terms of securing, securing the enterprise? Sure. So, so it comes down to kind of three things, right? Like firstly, you know, everyone's talked about digital revolution today, right? And, and digital transformation. Uh, what that brings is, you know, much of what you have on your background, right? Which is a lot of devices interconnected to each other, communicating to each other. And what we find is the typical IT organization, the typical security organization is aware of somewhere between 40 to 50% of what's actually on the network, right? So the first uh, kind of value proposition for Awake is really to give you an understanding of what's actually on your network. And that's both your traditional network, you know, the core, the perimeter, uh, the campus, the data center, but also your cloud, your IoT, your operational technology, et cetera. Um, the second thing is once you've done that, now we start talking about threat detection, right? And this is where, getting an understanding of how these devices, how these users, how these applications interact with each other, how insider credentials might be getting abused to do things that they're not supposed to. Uh, so we detect and we flag those behaviors. And then finally, helping you investigate and respond to them, all right? Because you, no one wants a security tool that just flashes a red light and then tells you good luck, right? You wanna be able to help them through that entire workflow. Uh, and that's something that we've been able to do at Awake as well. Awesome. Stay with us here, Rudy. We'll circle back to you in just a minute. Next up, we have Glenn Chilson. Glenn is the co-founder and CEO of Obsidian Security, another Greylock company. Glenn, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks for having us, Hunter. So give us a little overview of the issue that Obsidian's addressing, Glenn, in the context of the enterprise. Uh, Obsidian's focused on making sure that, you know, your use of SaaS and the cloud in your environment is secure, well-managed. You understand who's got access to your data, who's using your data. Um, do you have any potential attackers? Do you have any, any potential insiders? Is any of your data being leaked out of any of these collaboration platforms? And are the configurations appropriate, correct? And is your posture appropriate and your compliance appropriate with respect to these platforms? Excellent. And uh, how, how old are you as a company? We're three years old, so we're we're a Grella company. Three years old. We've been out there selling for about twelve months now, so we're you know we've, we've grown pretty pretty strongly in the last twelve months. So you're between your A and your B round. Uh, you're looking to meet other uh, enterprise executives that have this issue around SaaS. I've heard from major CISOs from formerly with major SaaS companies that there's a huge open API underneath the layer of the the cloud stack. Yeah, I mean we're we're, we're looking. You know, we're looking to meet people that are interested in SaaS security, that are deploying SaaS, that are expanding the use of it, particularly during COVID. You know, things like Salesforce and Workday and Zoom and Slack and 365. This combination of these amazing tools that provide amazing agility for corporations. But, you know, there's a risk associated with that. And we want to make sure that the agility and the speed and the versatility of these tools is enabled while we mitigate and reduce the risk. You're busy, I would imagine. Great. Stay with us, Glenn. We'll circle back here in just a minute. Next up, we have Monty Noti. Monty is the Director of Customer Success for Horizon 3 AI. Monty, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Hunter. Hey, look, thanks for your service. A little background, 30 seconds on your military background. I think it's pretty fascinating. You bet, sir. So uh, I have just retired after 26 years in the Air Force. I got to do both the defensive side, where I was a uh, deputy CISO. I got to do 
the offensive side is how I closed out my career, was running the Air Force Nation State Hackers that are uh, presented to Cybercom and go do some great things. And uh, in a little bit of the mix of all that, I got to grow up on the special ops side with Air Force Special Operations Command for a number of years. So it was a hell of a time. Very cool, Monty. So a little bit about Horizon 3, the issue that you're solving across the enterprise. You bet. So one of the things that having been a CISO and CIO, we found that people can get very uh, tools rich, but capabilities poor. And as a matter of fact, we're even going through some of the adjustments where we have CIOs, they're printing off lists of their tools and saying, hey, can you help me find out uh, what am I duplicating? What am I, uh, what uh, kind of funding do we need to displace to do these different things? And it was very frustrating when we were in those because you can't almost became more uh, fixated on configuration management than actually delivering value to some of your customers. And so that's really been at the heart of us making sure that we can fix what matters. And so what Horizon 3 AI does is much like you got to hear from Rudy just a little bit ago, we truly believe that hackers, that they uh, don't hack in, they log in. And so our ability is uh, to look at how your enterprise looks on the inside. We use a lot of automated AI driven capability where we are trying to take all of our nation state hacker uh, and attacker kind of tools and techniques and we automate them on the inside. We found that it's enabled us to really get a breadth and depth in, uh, and a knowledge of somebody's environment far beyond what they've had. And we're able to help them fix what matters much faster. So you're early stage, you're between early and A, right? You bet. It's interesting. Uh, from what Glenn said with Obsidian, they're three years old. We just hit one year old in our launches this week. So uh, it's been uh, moving hard and fast. Congratulations. We'll circle back. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, next up, Phil Richards. Phil's the CSO of Avante. Phil, welcome to the program. Hey, Hunter. Thanks. It's good to be with you again. Always. Hey, uh, you got some news with the Gartner's Magic Quadrant. If Gartner still matters... I'm not sure if it does, but what's yeah. going on with Gartner? Yeah, so uh, we uh, just got acknowledged as a leader in the uh, uh, in the service management space with our service management product called Avanti Service Manager. So that puts us right up in the uh, you know in, in that upper quadrant. That service management tool. Uh, I, I've been kind of a service management guy for for a number of years, and uh, the uh, the capabilities of having a good service management tool really can't be under so underestimated in terms of how it impacts your organization, how it uh, drives uh, change into your organization, and how it allows you to uh, consistently make sure that, uh, that that changes and and issues and incidents and everything are are handled consistently uh, throughout an organization. For for companies especially that are in uh, in regulated industries, that's particularly important. Uh, obviously, you want to be able to make sure that you're showing to uh, uh, to, to regulators that you're handling consistently, uh, you know, all the way, uh, you know, from from day one to day, uh, you know, at the end of six months or whatever, so that uh, you, you can go through your clean audits uh, and that kind of thing. Um, but even if you're not in a, in a you know, regulated industry, uh, having that level of consistency just means that these services, which are so critical to the success of an organization, are, are just lights out and, they're, and, and you're able to make sure that they get done uh, effectively the same every time. Excellent, uh, Phil. And so you're the one outlier in this program here. Uh, how big is uh, Avanti? Avanti is a is is a billion dollar company. Um, we've uh, we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty five hundred uh, employees or so. So it's a um, you know it, it's a growing uh, growing company. Of course, the uh, the the whole industry is is growing like crazy right now. Um, we're but you're uh, innovating though. I've heard that Avanti neurons is a disrupting force, right? Yeah, it's uh, it, that's very exciting. Neurons is our solution for the edge uh, compute devices. So it, it runs on our endpoint devices and uh, using machine learning, AI, and and bot technology, which I know we've talked about quite a bit today. Uh, it uh, it allows for organizations to be very nimble and very reactive to what's going on around them. Um, big organizations, as organizations get bigger, they they, they struggle to uh, to kind of maintain some of that nimbleness that maybe they had when they were smaller. Uh, with, with fewer employees and fewer devices, uh, through automation and AI and uh, and bot, te bot technology, we're able to kind of re-inject and reinvigorate some of that nimbleness into those organizations. Bill, thanks so much. Stay with me. I'll, I'll circle back here in just a minute. Hey, Rudy, back to you. Um, 
you know, Wake's doing some really interesting stuff. How do people get started with you? What's that look like? And what's a, what's a pilot look like? Yeah, so, you know, it's pretty quick to get up and running, right? Uh, essentially, we need access to uh, data, whether it's, uh, you know, in your cloud-based infrastructure, for instance, we can drop, uh, you know, a, 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 a virtual machine uh, within your EC2 uh, environment. And we, get, we now have access to the data that's going both between uh, the different cloud instances, but also from your on-premise to the cloud and, and so on. Um, and then within a couple of hours, we're telling you a few, uh, you know, a few things, right? We're telling you what's actually in those environments. Uh, and then we can start to detect threats that are either already in there, but, but threats that are coming in uh, as well. So, so the, the, the key uh, value that we like to deliver is that time to value, right? Because if, if it takes days, weeks, months to deliver value, you know, customers don't have the time for that anymore, uh, especially in this kind of environment. So, so yeah, we're very quick to get up and running, uh, uh, you know, literally in a matter of hours. Awesome. And the best interface would be a CISO or a CIO or... Yeah, so, so, so typically, you know, our users tend to be the, the people that run the security operations teams, right? The people that are basically day in, day out responsible for uh, looking at the threats uh, facing the organization, responding to them. Uh, usually that's part of the CISO's organization uh, uh, or, or in some, some organizations, part of the CIO's organization as well. So I can and ask to the uh, HMG network and the folks that are on the summit here today, if, if you know you, everyone's worried or concerned about security, but simply uh, help awake connect to the right security folks on your team to take a look at awake i think it's a, a top pick by hmg uh, really really impressed thanks for coming on the program you're also in the the, the hmg marketplace That's people right. can go there and learn more and set up a meeting so thanks so much rudy yeah thanks thanks for having me hunter hey glenn over to you walk me through a few examples of how obsidian is you being used today yeah, I mean, we're being used by organizations that have, you know, Salesforce deployments or Workday deployments that that have complex, you know, customer data in them, things like Workday that have financial data in them um, to understand, you know, who's accessing that data, where that data is being used, how it's being used, and being able to answer questions around, you know, access to content, you know, privileges. And it, it's effectively there to, to reduce the risk of the, these complex systems um, and make it really simple you know, through, through us being a SaaS platform deployed against the SaaS platform, you don't have to deploy any hardware, you don't have to deploy any software, you just connect us up to those SaaS platforms and we're fully operational. Awesome. And uh, so folks can get started with you, Glenn, how, what does that look like? Uh, they can go check us out in the HMG marketplace. They can, uh, they can use that as a reference to connect to us. Uh, we can get them up and running in, uh, in a few hours. Uh, we can prevent, pro, you know, provide them visibility to these, you know, these complex environments like Salesforce and, you know, who's doing what, what are the developers doing in that environment, Workday, Zoom, you know, who, who may be uh, engaging in Zoom shenanigans or something similar um, within a few hours after them connecting. So and your co-founder really is a, an amazing technologist as well, right? Yeah, one of my co-founders, Ben Johnson, was one of the co-founders of Carbon Black. So I was the CTO at Silence, which is one of the larger endpoint companies being built over the last 10 years. And Ben was the CTO at Carbon Black, which is one of the other large endpoints. So we both, we both left our respective endpoint companies and started doing something in the SaaS space because we thought this was an incredibly interesting and incredibly sort of uh, uh, valuable place to be. Awesome. Hey, thanks for coming on the program, Glenn. Great to see you. Thank you. Monty, over to you. Uh, when you think about uh, getting started with uh, Horizon 3, how can, they, how can folks do that? So people can go out to the website. We have a self-service uh, start in where people can log into the page with their LinkedIn information as well on some of our alphas and beta partners. We're provisioning accounts to make sure that they have access. They can see a sample op, what it looks like with the attacker's perspective. And then we even give them the uh, ability to go ahead and run their own ops. We've got about three running right now in banking and a manufacturing place where they are able to scope out what uh, areas they want to look at, what kind of things matter to them. And then they're able to pull their ops back and uh, go through their results. And we'll even walk them through a little bit of that themselves that they need. Awesome. Hey, good to see you, Monty. Thanks for coming on the good program. Good to see you too, Hunter. Yeah. And Phil, final word from you. Um, great time to be a tech professional. And how can folks get in touch with uh, you at Avanti? Uh, well, yeah, I think it is a great time to be a, a tech professional. Uh, obviously, with, uh, with with the global pandemic, the focus is, has been on technology and 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 security from an IT perspective uh, for probably the past six, eight, ten months. 
uh, even more hyper focused than it, than it was before. And uh, so, so there are some great opportunities in uh, in technology as a result of that. Um, our, you know, the Avanti team is, it stands ready to help organizations provide some, uh, some, some fantastic services and capabilities. Uh, and uh, the, the way to get in touch with us, we've, we obviously there's, there's Avanti.com. You can go to the, uh, you know, the HMG marketplace um, and uh, contact, you know, get in touch with uh, one of our many qualified sales professionals who uh, can help serve you better. Excellent, Phil. Hey, thanks for the program. Great job, uh, Rudy, Glenn, Phil, Monty. Thanks so much. Look forward to seeing all of you very soon at another upcoming HMG Summit. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, uh, now we're on to the envisioning future disruption and developing radical new business models. And w welcome back, Joe Puglisi, uh, VP of IT at NICE uh, PAC to facilitate this stellar panel. Uh, Joe, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks, Hunter. It's great to be here. And I have a wonderful panel lined up. Uh, with me today is Candace Fleming, whom we've already heard from, v CIO and VP of Information Technology at Montclair State. Mike Hughes, Senior Executive Product Marketing at OutSystems. Deepal Negrath, uh, Senior Vice President of Product Development at ADP. And Shola Aliwali, uh, Vice President of Digital Innovation at United Therapeutics. Thank you all for coming on the program today. You know, earlier we heard Clark Galastani report how companies have used technology to transform and drive better business outcomes, especially in this COVID-19 environment where competition has been so heightened and the need to change is almost life or death for companies. CK also emphasized uh, the need for speed. And, and Mike, I'm going to start with you. What is OutSystems recently hosted uh, their Next Step conference, and a number of your customers were featured. So we want to hear some of the shifts in the business models that your customers have experienced. Can you talk about that? Sure, Joe. Uh, thanks for having me on. Appreciate that. Um, you know, my, my title may say marketing, but over 20 years of, 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 has been in technology. So uh, hopefully, don't don't judge me too quickly there. Uh, but one of the one of the uh, great aspects of my role is I get to work with our customers during our Next Step event. Um, we had 18 customers speaking from around the world uh, and, and, and digging into their stories was, was just very, very illuminating, right? Gave a good, good uh, view of what's really happening to organizations and the sorts of change they're going through. So I'll just give a few examples to kind of start us off. But uh, uh, Estafeta, a Mexican logistics company, um, spoke at the, at the event. Hit by the pandemic, they basically had an 83% drop in in shipping volume, right, as their, as their people were out and they were unable to deliver. Uh, they needed an alternative very, very quickly. In a matter of just 10 days, they were able to create a new solution, uh, enabling partners to deliver packages for them. So Uber, taxi companies, third-party drivers, and so on. Uh, and when they spoke at Next Step, they had over 2,300 external users now helping and had delivered over, over a million packages using that new channel. In fact, they, they've now grown delivery volume by over 50%. So something that was you know, a challenge has now become a new business channel, a new business opportunity for them, and they were able to adapt very quickly. Lucro, US-based credit union services company, huge surge in loan volumes because of the PPP, right, the Paycheck Protection Program. They had to improve their processes to cope in under a week, built a new app to streamline that process, handled thousands of PPP loans, right, helping businesses around, around the US. Stem Cell Technologies, last example, a biotech company based in Canada, uh, had to move to work from home, of course, like most of us, uh, and needed to be able to support their employees. Literally overnight, developed a mobile app to be able to track employee wellness, track the location of key assets to enable them to do, uh, to run their business. So, you know, the key themes are as technology, you know, we talk about speed technology as the enabler in many cases, it takes people as well. Um, but the timeframes now, we're talking about days and weeks, right? This is not months and years. Uh, the, time, the time window to respond is, is shrunk amazingly. Wow, that's remarkable. So, so they leverage third-party delivery services to augment the, the deficiency they had through this, through this application. That's really cool. Yeah. But let me go over to Vipal, if I may. How, how did ATP shift its technology to, to deal with this pandemic? Sure. So um, look, as, as we all went through all this, right, we, we, we had a lot of things we had to pivot and shift to very quickly. Now, as many of you may be aware, you know, ADP, we have over 810,000 clients globally, uh, servicing over 40 million 
uh, employees of, of the client employees where, where, where we're doing payroll and other uh, uh, HR human capital um, management functions for them. Now, in an, and on top of that, we had 58,000 of our own employees that we had to very quickly shift and get home. So the first movement came is that we had to get all of our technologists, all of our salespeople, all of our, all of our customer service people home and up and ready and working. And that happened at, at, at breakneck speed. And, and literally we didn't, within a couple of weeks, within a few weeks, we were all home and fully you know, up and running and productive. Then as all around the world, we had new sets of regulation that came out, new, new um, programs that were coming out, like, like right here in the United States. Um, Mike just talked about the PVP. But before we had the payroll protection plan, we had the FFCRA, which is the Families First uh, of Cares, the Relief Cares Act, right? Or also known as the Cares Act. So we had to pivot and shift and add into our products and build products and new solutions for our clients to be able to get the information that they needed to go apply for, for, for those loans, to be able to understand what the tax ramifications will be and, and what the filing ramifications will be if they take the CARES Act. And then also try to balance between the two, which you know, did this program A work better for me or does program B work better for me? So we, we had to use a lot of our own insight um, as well as actually take the, you know, the official guidance that we're getting from the government uh, and be able to offer up solutions to our clients uh, and make them effective and make sure that, look, they, they still have the trust in what they were doing, that they still have the trust in, in, in our systems. Um, I mean, look, within, what, what that actually resulted in is we had over a 50% increase in, in inquiries coming to us um, you know, early on. And because literally companies were like, hey, what do we do, right? Uh, we need your help, ADP. Um, within three days of uh, the CARES Act passing, we actually had one solution out there. Uh, on the PPP uh, uh, loan side, you know, as the loan was made available, we had the data available for our clients to use to go apply for the loan, right? Because you actually needed to show what your payroll looked like. And what a uh, num number of people don't realize is that if you had employees making over $100,000, they, they were not eligible for the PPP loan. So you couldn't use those employees as part of the basis for, 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 for your loan. So we had to get all these business rules into the system very quickly. Um, and as Mike said, yeah, this, this, this wasn't about like, hey, take some months and go figure it out. This was get it, figure it out in hours and days and release it in days, right? And, and uh, just get everyone up and running. So that was the stuff that we did immediately uh, during that. Now there's other things we're, we're working on now as we're coming through from that, because guess what? Now it's time to repay those loans or get forgiveness for them. Right. Right. So not, not only did you have to be agile in, a, a, in a shifting regulatory sands, but you also had to have the developers and the testers and all this coordination in a completely distributed fashion. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was, it, it was quite a challenge. And I, I will say I was very proud of how the entire company responded and worked to this. Because, yes, look, we were as technologists, we were there to make sure as the enablers to make sure it happened. But then the whole company had to actually use what we built. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Henry Taub must be just smiling from on high, right? <laughs> so let me go to Candace. You're in the academic world. How are students reacting to the changes in the ways that classes are now being delivered during this pandemic? Uh, we all know that there's probably some, some behavioral issues on, on campuses around the country, but uh, generally speaking, how, how are they receiving this, this new environment? Well, speed seems to be the name of the game on today's conference. So as you all know, last spring as the pandemic hit, like all educational institutions, we pivoted all classes online. The faculty got a longer spring break. They get five more days and they convert all their materials. Um, we worked with them on the best teaching practices in an online environment. But candidly, there wasn't a whole lot of time to get ready. So we probably shouldn't have been surprised that at the end of spring term, um, we did some student surveys and the students told us that they wanted to return to campus. They said they want that social and intellectual stimulation of engaging with their peers. And we know a little drinking involved too, but of actually coming to class and engaging with their faculty and their peers. Plus, we actually believe that students learn better when they are in an on-campus environment. So we went nuts. 
putting in new technologies, cleaning protocols, practices that would actually allow faculty to teach both students in the classroom and Zoom at the same time and actually do it well, we thought. Um, but once the fall term started, again, maybe not surprising, um, we did discover that fewer students showed up in the classroom than we were expecting. Um, and a lot of them still engage online, even if it's from their dorm room. But when you thought about it, what they told us is engaging with say half a dozen students in the classroom, social distancing, is not the same as engaging with a whole class. You know, the rest of their colleagues, their student colleagues were online, Zooming. So they didn't necessarily feel it made sense to make it to the classroom. So we really discovered that it becomes really important to reestablish that campus culture. It's as important to have activities going on on campus um, as to have high quality learning materials. So we're really working on trying to bring that culture back, albeit in a slow phased fashion as we're all working through this COVID climate this crisis. That's interesting because we, we haven't really talked about the loss of that sort of camaraderie, uh, stimulation of being in groups in the business world, right? We're all working from home and Zooming together uh, and, and we also miss that opportunity. And I want to ask you one more question, Candace, if I may. How have the faculty adapted to classes online? Do they like it better or, or are they put off? Well, there's actually two answers to that. So first of all, faculty, like all the rest of us, have been really afraid to go back to interacting with people in, on campus or in person. Um, they're just concerned about safety. And in that sense, they prefer to be teaching online, whereas we're trying to get them back to campus. Um, what we found is it's been really important to implement the CDC recommended protocols and then be really transparent with faculty as well as students and parents about what we're doing so that they feel safer being on campus. But then the second part is frankly, it's been a ton more work for the faculty to prepare to teach online, on campus, hybrid, could switch from day to day, from hour to hour, depending on what Governor Murphy is saying this week. Um, so we've really been working hard with them to adapt their teaching styles to try to be as effective. But overall, they've been amazing and been putting in a ton more work to be able to teach in all these different modalities actually simultaneously. Ah, oh, that's great. That's great. Hey, I'm going to come back to you, Candace, but I'm going to go to Shola now for a moment and, and uh, talk about something near and dear to my heart, you know, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I, I support both NICEPAC and PDI, which we all know is in the pharmaceutical space. Uh, what impact has the pandemic had on your industry, Shola, or our industry? Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Well, my company, um, our focus is in drug development in what you call orphan drug market. And that is a market that comprises patients, uh, patient size of less than 200,000. And for that reason, um, customer intimacy is our number one priority. It is so important that we have close relationships with our, our doctors and our patients to make sure we're providing the best therapy possible for our patients. For that reason, our sales force are trained and um, equipped, all right, to build those relationships. Now, as you know, in the pharmaceutical industry, sales reps have to visit doctors to teach them or inform them about the new drugs that they carry. Well, with the pandemic, doctors stopped those visits. Their focus became purely to their patients and the sickness of their patients. So sales reps in the industry in general stopped making house visits, so to speak. So what we did was, because we already have intimate relationships with our doctors as well as our patients, we pivoted to embrace technology, video technology, FaceTiming, Zoom calls, Teams calls. But many of you would ask and say, well, why didn't people do this before? Well, the reason is simple. In the healthcare industry, medical doctors have been very reluctant to adopt that kind of technology to see patients because it wasn't necessarily reimbursable. You know, how do you 
bill a patient for a two minute call when if they came into the office, you could bill them for a one hour visit. But with the pandemic occurring, doctors were forced to begin to see patients leveraging technology that's called telemedicine. And because doctors became comfortable with telemedicine, they became comfortable dealing with our sales reps using technology. So that was the way we've been able to keep our relationship strong with the healthcare practitioners and our patients. The pandemic has made the industry itself, the medical industry, comfortable with video technology. That, that's awesome. That's awesome. Stay right there, Shola. I want to. I want to read something. Uh, according to a recent Forbes article, I just saw this the other day. Response to the business potential of digital technologies, which you're talking about here, is still lukewarm at best, with only half the executives buying into the potential. This was the interesting part. Slightly more than half, 52%, see artificial intelligence as very or extremely relevant to their business. How, how is UT leveraging AI or machine learning in the pharmaceutical industry? Fantastic question. Again, because my company, UT, participates in what you call the orphan drug market, because of the limited size of patients, that the dearth of information, meaning there isn't enough data. So what we've done is we've rolled out, or we're in the process of rolling out machine learning tools that can provide insights that are inferred from what you call surrogate data. So while you might not have direct data about patients and their illnesses, you can infer from surrogate data what patients are, or what therapies patients are already on. And that can be your target market, so to speak. So in short, we're leveraging machine learning to build better insight into new markets we're expanding into. Today, our open drug market is a pulmonary hypertension market. Our new market is um, the manufacturing of lungs either through 3D printing, xenotransportation, which is altering the genes of pigs and growing organs in them to be further transplanted into humans. That is our goal. And as you know, that market is today does not really exist. So by using machine learning and forms of AI, we can begin to find insights as to the possibility of the size of that market. Incredible. And, and that, that is what we've heard earlier speakers talk about. We're creating entirely new businesses out, out of this new environment that we find ourselves in with the kind of computing power and, and the data analytic technologies that we have. You know, it, it, the, the, uh, you, can, you can figure out the efficacy of your drugs. You can probably model the success rate of these artificial organs. We can only hope that the, the FDA and the other regulatory agencies also accelerate their abilities to uh, approve these things and get them to market sooner. Hey, I want to jump over to, back to uh, Vipal and ask the same question. How is ADP using AI or data insights to address some of the issues they're facing these days? Well, on top of everything else we've had going on this year with the pandemic and uh, you know a, a global pandemic, we've also had in this country some very specific social issues and social unrest that we've had to deal with. So one of the places, in fact, where we've been using our data insights and our AI um, is, is through a, a, a set of services we call data cloud. So we have an entire data cloud set of services where from data cloud, we can do uh, executive manager insights. We do storyboards. Uh, we do compensation benchmarking. Uh, we have a skills cloud. Uh, we do organizational benchmarking and we also do data mashups so where we're taking data from different systems and putting them together and getting the insight out of that. So one specific thing that uh, we've done, or, or I say two specific areas right now for the social unrest that's going on, is one, we've got some pay equity storyboards. And those pay equity storyboards are used to give managers insights into places where they may have gaps or pay equity gaps when it comes to gender or uh, race or ethnicity. And then once the managers have those insights into those gaps, now they can take actions to go correct them, right? Otherwise it's like, hey, if you don't know the problem that, that it's there, how can you can go fix it? 
but we use the data in our customer systems to show them where they might be having these, these uh, uh, pay, pay gaps um, and, and, and the reasons that could be causing it, right? So they can take those actions. In addition to that, um, we're working on, and not yet released, we're working on some DNI, some diversity and inclusion storyboards uh, and, um, and, and, and some um, things that will make it basically really easy for our clients to see what is diversity and inclusion really look like deep in the organization. Not just something you talk about at, at a high level, but really organizationally what's going on in there um, so that they can, they can um, see from dashboards what is their population look like? What does it look like by level? Meaning, do I have the same representation at every level of management as I do at, at, at my front lines, right? It's not enough to say, hey, hey, look, I've got 30% of this population represented, but is it represented at every level? So it's, it's those types of things that, that, we're, that we're working on. And you're, we're using the uh, algorithms and machine learning data insights and AI to surface all this information for us. And, and I'm sure you're also taking into consideration privacy and security uh, because this, these, these data are quite sensitive. I imagine you want to protect them. As, as Absolutely. Well. Yeah. And, and, and again, like th these are solutions that, that we're offering building for our clients to use on their own data. Right. When, when we have benchmark data from the industry, that's, that's all, it, it's, it's all, uh, um, you know, non-identifiable. So it's just that here, it's just a benchmark that's out and you can see how you're doing it's a benchmark, but for your own company, we give you that insight of what does it look like from a, um, you know, a diversity, we will be building that diversity and inclusion dashboard and we already have the, the pay equity storyboards. Great, great. Hey, I see by Mickey's big hand that we're, we're technically out of time, but I wanna give everybody an opportunity to close uh, with some comments on, on this last point. Companies returning to the workplace, you know, I read that Google, Target, Microsoft, Ford, and, and probably some others now have all announced work from home programs through July of next year. People, as long as you're on the screen. I'll sure. You first. How is technology going to improve employee support as companies look to bring their people back to the office in greater numbers? Yeah, look, I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we're working on, I think there's others working on these similar solutions is, um, for the return to workplace, we built a set of solutions where we can survey uh, folks. How are they feeling? Like, do you even feel comfortable coming back in? Um, we can allow the, the managers or, or administrators to do selection of what groups they want to bring back. Like, do you want to start at 10%, 25%? How do you want to bring them back? Assign those return dates. Um, get attestations from every employee on a, literally right now we're doing it on a daily basis. Uh, do contact tracing. Uh, and in addition to that, also provide um, solutions. And in fact, we've already got this released where when you walk up to the front desk and, and, and the kiosk is we've made that touchless. We will use facial recognition so you can clock in to get into work as opposed to even physically having to touch something or put down your, 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 your fingerprint or swipe your badge to, to walk into the office. Awesome. Awesome. Hunter, are we, uh, we out of time or uh, pretty much so out of time, but final cl the closing comment, I always like to finish it like this, Joe, uh, Candy, the best time ever to be a tech professional? <laughs> I don't know. I think it depends on what hour you ask me. But I have to admit, the last six months have been fascinating. I don't want the next six months to be just like them, please. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, Mike? Yeah, I mean, you know, as a vendor, it's a great time to work with technology professionals. Right? The, the, the compelling events of, you know, around us and, and the, the time to change has shrunk so much that, you know, there's, that there's a lot of help. To, to give and, and people are receptive. So it's a good time to be a technology. Excellent. Shola? Well, I like to call it um, a merger of both. I just say, you know, business now, technology is a part of the business. Now technology sits at the table we've always wanted all along. Kudos to all of you all. Love it, love it. Uh, and then we got VIP, VIP, final word. Yeah, final word. I, I, I think uh, I think Shola said it very well, but reality is is technology, it's really it it is now showing up in the outcomes, right? The actual outcomes are based on the things that we're delivering. Awesome. Joe. Hey, you've already asked me this question. I'll repeat I'll repeat my answer. Best time ever. Great job. Great job, guys. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh and by the way, uh great summit. The content really was exceptional. 
Thank you. Yeah. Very, very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Big shout out to New Jersey Sim. If you're not a member, as Candace mentioned, join. Uh, it's a great organization. I'm a proud member as well. Steve Landry, a shout out to Steve Landry and Gene, the other folks, the other folks at uh, New Jer on the New Jersey Sim board and members. Uh, a big thank you to our partners here today, Avanti, uh, Out Systems, uh, and sorry there, uh, Sonatype. Really appreciate it. Um, as well, my new book. Everyone's going to get a digital copy, Enterprise 2025. Uh, and we're on Zoom. By the way, the first quote in the back cover, Eric Wan uh, says, Hunter reminds us now is unquestionably the best time to be a tech leader. He's pretty successful, I think, in changing the world, keeping us all connected. Um, and I thought CK was awesome in the beginning. Mark Polanski was great. And wasn't Clark uh, just, uh, just hit it out of the park, right? So folks, this is the level. We've raised the bar to a different level, a different height. And I think it's a uh, real amazing uh, testimonial to all the relationships that we have regionally, nationally, and globally here at HMG. And we're looking to up-level the game uh, and make you guys rock stars. Um, we're going to segue over to the recognition program. And I want to invite uh, August Pelicchio onto, the, uh, onto the, the program. August, you there? Hey, Hunter. Thank you. August has uh, been me, with me a year. He's a brilliant uh, mastermind behind our social media, global social media program, helping brand you and getting all of you all out on the World Wide Web with us, with our jet stream, our smoke screen, getting your brand associated with us and helping with the HMG recognition program, which is now 12 years strong. And uh, now we have a, a couple of tech leaders here that we want to recognize. Uh, and August, I'll let you kick it off. Sure, thanks, Hunter. And thank you, everyone, for staying to the end of the program here to see the, our two uh, recognition recipients here. Uh, I'd like to welcome Joseph Puglisi back onto the screen. We just had him here on our last panel, but uh, hey, Joe, how are you? Great job today. Really, really stunning. Thank you. So Joe's team has released some really innovative solutions for customer experience and product delivery within the context of this COVID pandemic. Um, Joe's the VP IT for Nice Pack products, I'm sure you heard earlier. Uh, none of the rapid change is possible without some sort of soft skills, though. You know, I, Joe, I know you talked earlier about your three golden rules. I really want to touch on them again because they're so genius. Um, Joe wants to be the first to know when something goes wrong. Uh, don't let critical technology upgrades impact long-term results. Don't get in the way of business, meaning. Uh, and your opinion matters. Uh, no one works for Joe, people work with Joe and with each other. Joe's being recognized for being a courageous and authentic leader. Uh, that's something we take very seriously at HMG Strategy. He fosters healthy working relationships with his employees. He set rules and guidelines that have repeatedly brought him success and tries not to overcomplicate them uh, so he doesn't repeat past mistakes. But number one, listening and learning are incredibly important tools for him. And we really admire that about you. Congratulations, Joe. Thank you very much. I appreciate the recognition. Joe, it's been a great run. I think we've been collaborating now for over 20 years. And I, I really, uh, you're one of the individuals I always stop and listen to and really admire your leadership style over two decades. Thank you. Thank you, Hunter. Appreciate it. It's, it's been a great run. I, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, working with you and HMG and watching HMG grow and become the great organization it is today. It's been a real trip. Awesome. And you've been a great uh, player and a participant in that. So thank you. Thanks, Joe. Congratulations again. Uh, finally, we'd like to welcome uh, Ruta Almeida back onto the screen or onto the screen. Good afternoon, Ruta. How are you? I think you're on mute here. Let's, there you go. I'm doing good. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi, Hunter. Hey, Ruta. Ruta is the CISO of Delta Dental of New Jersey and Connecticut. Ruta has over 15, almost 20 years of direct experience in establishing and maintaining global security strategies, architectures, standards, and compliance while driving the necessary cultural changes to affect measurable improvements in the organization's security posture. 
We consider Ruta a, a front runner in the security industry. We're always happy to have you on HMG Live. Such an educal, educational experience for us and our audience. So congratulations to you and your team. And I also just want to say, uh, before we hand it over to you, uh, the, the concept of teamwork is, is very important to us. And we really believe that that's pushed through the pandemic. So also wanted to uh, recognize a little bit Justin Lahulier, who's with us earlier on your team. Um, you know, if you want to pop back on the screen, you're welcome to. But Ruta, congratulations to you and your team. Yeah, Thank you. I would just say uh, Ruta's done a great job with the team. Um, and, and you know you have a, a, a top leader when you don't have to manage them all that much. So Ruta does her thing, and she's brought uh, a lot of security into the organization and has really changed the culture. So. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, uh, Hunter, August, and HMG Strategy. I'm really uh, very happy to be uh, recognized. And um, I, my association with Hunter and HMG goes a long back. And I have um, attended many, many in-person uh, sessions and summits. Uh, and I will continue to do so. Thank you very much uh, for appreciating all the hard work that I have put in uh, the security industry over the years. Um, so very uh, happy and privileged to receive this award. Awesome, Ruta, great job. And uh, I really appreciate all your active engagement with the network and our summits, really, and great job. And thank you, Justin, for very, very kind words. Awesome. Excellent. I, I think as a wrap, uh, August, I think finally, uh, just a word that we have in, uh, in uh, later in October, our first ever Women in Technology Summit. Is it uh, October 26? 26th. 26th. Uh, check out that program, a World Class Agenda, folks, uh, as well as we'll be building out a CXO panel to look at hot emerging technologies with us alongside us as we look to make strategic bets on some of the top tech providers uh, out of the valley and from around the world. Uh, until next time, uh, be good, be safe, and uh, lead on. Have fun. <laughs>